Are there any leftover questions or thoughts about <laughs> on <laughs> his empiricism and the relations of ideas that we just went over? So here's section four is actually the more interesting, I would say is the most interesting part of our whole reading. This is, this is what tonight is all about. Uh, section four is titled On uh, Skeptical D Doubts Concerning the Operations of the Understanding. This is one of Hume's famous skeptical arguments that I want us to spend some time thinking about. Before we get into the skepticism, we've got some vocabulary. He introduces us to first what he calls relations of ideas. And the, con the contrary to this, or the comparison with that, is what he calls matters of fact. Relations of ideas are things that he says you can discover by thinking alone. You don't need any additional experience to figure out any of these claims. And relations of ideas are such that the contraries of them are impossible. Typically, these are found in truths from geometry, algebra, or arithmetic. <coughs> For example, all triangles have three sides. You can't imagine, he, so this, all triangles have three sides, it would be impossible to imagine a triangle that has more or less than three sides. You can't do that. Um, if you know what a triangle is, and it follows, it's got to have three sides. Now, um, the other kind of thing is what he calls a matter of fact. A matter of fact is, according to him, founded on reasoning by cause and effect, which are known by experience. And the contraries of these sorts of truths are possible. So one of the examples he gives is the claim that the sun will rise tomorrow. Something we all believe, the sun will rise tomorrow, but the in, we can imagine that tomorrow it doesn't possible, in some sense, that tomorrow the sun won't rise and it's the end of the world, for us at least. So, um, matters of fact are different than relations of ideas in these ways. Relations of ideas are things you know just through thought alone, it's absolutely certain, and um, matters of fact, by the other hand, are just things that you know through cause and effect reasoning and and you can, and all of these sorts of things are possibly false. <coughs> yeah. Isn't the relations of ideas similar to what Leibniz was getting at a while back? Exactly. So what were, what did Leibniz call those? Do you remember? Uh, necessary. I think. He called them truths of. Do you remember? I don't remember. Reason. No, reason. Truths of reason, and then truths of fact. <coughs> these are exactly. In fact, this is this. The connection you made is the exact one I wanted someone to make, which is, this is the exact same distinction. There, I don't know if Hume read Leibniz, um, but they definitely are carving out the exact same distinction here. So, here's, our, here's a question for us to consider, or a topic for us to ponder. It may therefore be a subject worthy of curiosity to inquire, what is the nature of that evidence which assures us of any real existence and matter of fact beyond the present testimony of our senses or the records of our memories? In other words, we, so for relations of ideas, there's not, when you understand them, there's really no doubt about their truth. But what about matters of fact? If, these, these are all claims that we could imagine could be false. They're also the more interesting claims in our lives. Claims about, you know, there's a person sitting next to me. Why do you believe that? Because you believe that this idea in your mind of the person next to you is caused by some person who's actually sitting next to you. It's not just a hallucination or an illusion. You think, when I go out to my car and I turn the key in the ignition, I think my car is going to start. Why? Because, um, well, that's a good question, why? That's what he wants to inquire. But you, you don't have any doubt about that, that, that the turning of the key will cause the starting of the car, unless you have a really bad car, in which you might have some doubts. Um, but most of us, you know, we're pretty sure it's going to start. <coughs> um, 
Another way to think about this is how do we go from our knowledge of what we observe to what we have not observed? And notice the way that he puts this in the quote here. Um, the nature of the evidence which assures us of any real existence and matter of fact beyond the present testimony of our senses. In other words, to those things we have yet to observe. This is sometimes thought of as what's called the problem of induction. The problem of induction tries to get us to see the connection or figure out how do we go from a claim like number one, all observed P's are Q. So what do I mean by that? Like all observed ravens are black. But we conclude, therefore, all, even the unobserved ravens, are black. But we haven't observed every single raven in the universe, right? Um, there surely have been some ravens that have existed that no human being has observed. But we're, we think that it's rational to think of that raven, or those ravens, that they're black, just like all the other ones. What's the connection between all the things we have observed and all the things we have, and the, the same things that we have not observed. Why well, think that they are similar? Um, one of the examples that Hume uses in this essay is about eating and food. That you think the next piece of bread that you're going to bite into is going to nourish you. But how do you know it's not going to kill you? So, what this debate is really about, in a way, I think, is trying to come up with a way to justify a claim like number two here. That unobserved things will resemble the observed things. That, why do, I, why do we think the, ra the, ne the ravens we have yet to observe will be black? Because there's some resemblance, there is some pattern, there's some connection between what I've observed and what I've not observed. Since all the ravens I have observed up till now have been black, we think that's good grounds for thinking the unobserved raven will be black. Since all the bread I've eaten up till now has been nourishing, I think, well, then the next piece of bread that is sufficiently like all the other ones will also be nourishing. But Hume is going to say this kind, there's no possible reason you could give for thinking that a claim like number two is true. In fact, what he's going to try to argue in this case is that if we're depending on reason to inform us about this, that you're just as reasonable in thinking that the next raven will be black as you would also be thinking the next raven will be white or blue or purple. That there's really no rational basis for thinking that the next raven is going to be black. There's no rational basis for thinking the next time you turn your car key, it's going to start your car. There's no rational basis for thinking that the sun will rise tomorrow. There is no rational basis for thinking that when the next piece of bread you eat, it's going to nourish you. Could just as well kill you. Let's see what his reasoning is. Um, so for Hume, the answer to our question is there's no good reasoning that can show why we should believe number two. This takes us back, though, to our vocabulary we just learned. So, section four is divided into two parts. The first part is aimed at showing that the claim that unobserved things will resemble observed things, it cannot be known or justified as a relation of ideas. And I put out in parentheses here the idea that it can't be justified a priori, meaning a part, uh, a priori means apart from experience, just conceptually alone. And here's roughly how he argues um, in the first part. He says, if this were true, like if you really could figure out the effect from some cause, just by knowing the causes, then you could deduce that the effect would follow from the cause, just by contemplating those ideas and imagining what must follow. And of course, he says, that's crazy. Um, his example is with billiard, billiard balls. And I want to read this on 543 on the right side. Um, if you look at the middle paragraph on 543, we're going to start just a little bit below halfway into that one. So he says, 
we fancy that were we brought all of the sudden into the world, we could at first have inferred that one billiard ball would communicate motion to another upon impulse and that we did not need to have waited for the event in order to pronounce with certainty concerning it. Such is the influence of custom that where it is strongest, it not only covers our natural ignorance, but even conceals itself and seems not to take place. And what he goes on to illustrate with this is, I mean, the idea is this. Suppose you were just brought into existence as a fully mature being all at once. And your very first experience that you're going to observe is one billiard ball about to strike a second one. Hume says, before it strikes the second billiard ball, would you be able, if you've never had any past experiences of these things, or, or any physical objects interacting with one another, would you be able to figure out what's going to happen when they make contact? His answer is no, you wouldn't know it. You don't know when it hit, when they make contact, is the, so if it's the cue ball hitting the eight ball. You don't know if when the cue ball strikes the eight ball, if the cue ball is just going to bounce right back at you. Or if when the cue ball hits the eight ball, that it just comes to a complete stop and neither one moves again. You don't know if when the cue ball hits the eight ball, that they just burst into flames. Um, you don't know if when the cue ball hits the eight ball, the eight ball just goes straight up in the middle of the air. If you've never experienced these things, you have no idea what one thing is going to cause the other thing to do. The only way you learn that is through experience. What about if you hadn't experienced that, but you had experienced physics? What do you mean by experienced physics? Uh, not ex not so much as experienced physics, I guess, but n know about it. Um, if you hit a ball and you use like force equals mass times acceleration, you could figure out what's going to happen with right. the other ball? So you could if you had enough background knowledge of physics, but where the, ultimately that knowledge has to be eventually grounded in the experience of it. Whoever okay. wrote that book or came up with those laws did it because they observed it. They didn't just think about it and come up with it. Right, okay. And that's all Hume's point is that, for now, is that you, can, you can't deduce the effect of something just by thinking about its cause. In essence, he's also trying to say causes are distinct from their effects. One of the things that may have been a prominent idea prior to Hume was this idea that in some way effects are contained within their causes. So that if you just really had thought about a cause, maybe you could think about the effect that was con because the effect was sort of included in the cause. So that in some way, like in a match head, the fire is somehow literally contained within the match head, and when you strike it, you're just sort of like unlocking it, releasing it. Um, what Hume is saying is that that's not true, that causes are different and distinct things from their effects. And really, any two things could be causally related to one another. There's nothing special, for instance, when I come over here and I push down on these switches, that it turns the lights off. And when I push them up, the lights come on. We could have wired these switches such that when I push those things down, that it opens the windows. Or that when I flip the switch, that it turns the projector off. I mean, there's nothing intrinsic, there's no intrinsic connection between the cause and the effect. It's just a contingent relationship. It's just something that happens to be so. But we could have wired it up any other way. And the same thing goes for causes in nature. Things could have been different in nature. There was no necessary reason why these things had to be connected in this way. Why we can come up with, for instance, with mathematical models of physics, where when you do have the billiard ball hit the other one, it bounces back. Um, let's take a look at his conclusion to this section. because This is not really the, the most important part of his argument, but it's important to cover because it covers all of its bases. So look on 544, on the left-hand side, that little paragraph that starts with, in a word, there. It says, in a word, then, every effect is a distinct event from its cause. It could not, therefore, be discovered in the cause and the first invention or conception of it, a priori. It must be entirely arbitrary. 
And even after it is suggested, the conjunction of it with the cause must appear equally con uh, arbitrary, since there are always many other effects which to reason must seem fully as consistent and natural. In vain, therefore, should we pretend to determine any single event or infer any cause or effect without the assistance of observation and experience. Bottom line, you can't figure out causes, you can't figure out effects just by contemplating causes. The only way you can figure out effects and how they're related to their causes is to make several observations. So, the point he's trying to make stands. You cannot, uh, observe, unobserved things will resemble observed things. That claim cannot be known or justified just by thinking about them, just by contemplating that, those thoughts as relations of ideas. Any questions about anything in part one from, uh, from section four here? Is that a hand? Sort of. Well, okay. Can, how does that account for like um, the, the laws of physics that we're talking about? Like uh, an object will continue unless acts upon. Because in our experience, like you throw something and then it eventually stops. So how does this reconcile that? So what he would want to say is that, I mean, he, the laws of physics would have to be informed through experience. Like we couldn't just come up with laws of physics apart from, we can't just theorize them apart from making observations about how objects move. Um, so your, is your question more specific to, to trying to get zero in on it? Like, I feel like, like I'm I, missing that. I, I don't know. How would he, I, maybe I should just learn how to explore how, I guess, like Galileo thought. I don't know. So, I mean, like, for instance, we theorize things based on friction. Um, you know, that tell, you know, friction in the air, fi friction with contact on the ground, that perfect laws of physics work in like frictionless, you know, environments. But everything has varying degrees of friction and that explains why there are, you know, why objects eventually stop rolling and, and so forth. So it was, we got that idea by thinking about what would happen if you took away friction and other stuff. Right. All right. So the second part is then the one that probably you think if there is a way to justify cause and effect relationships, it's got to be through experience. However, Hume is going to say you can't get it that way either. Let's see how this is supposed to go. So section four, part two, what he's saying is that the claim that unobservable things will resemble observed things, it cannot be known or justified as a matter of fact, meaning through experience. So you might, the, the first thing I might say if I were to try to get you to say, well, why think that the unobserved raven is black? And you would say, because all the observed ones are black. Or if I say tomorrow, why do you think the sun is going to rise? You're going to say, because in the past, the sun has always rise, it has risen. In other words, my past experience, isn't that good evidence for future? experiences? As to past experience, Hume tells us, it can be allowed to give a direct and certain information of those precise objects only, and that precise period of time which fell under its cognizance. But why this experience should be extended to future times and to other objects, which for all we know may be only similar in appearance. So one of the things that Hume is raising here is that what does your past experience tell you? It tells you about the past, and that's it. Um, just because every, so every observed raven is black, it doesn't mean that an unobserved raven, that the, the ravens we've yet to observe will have to be black. It might be, maybe, you know, purple ravens are shy creatures, and so they stay away from people. Um, there was this problem, I mean, people thought in Europe for the longest time that swan, all swans are white. Why is that? Because every swan they had observed was a white swan. But, anybody know where there are different colored swans? Mm -hmm. In Australia. And what color are they? Black. Yeah. In Australia, 
we, uh, the Europeans eventually made their way down there, and what did they find? Black swans. The fact that every swan they had observed was white was not good reason. It didn't necessarily entail that the next swan they were going to see was going to be white. It's always possible that the next swan is a different color. <coughs> Just because every piece of bread you've ever eaten has given you nourishment instead of killed you, it doesn't mean that the next one, by, you know, by necessity, has to give you nourishment. It's always possible it could kill you. In the same way, just because every day that you've been alive the sun has risen, it doesn't mean that tomorrow the sun must rise. Your past experience doesn't necessitate that the future is going to pan out the way you think it will. Um, it could be different. When talking about this problem, um, a philosopher named Bertrand Russell uses an example of a turkey. So, as, you know, the turkey, every day, the farmer comes out and feeds them. So, the turkey starts to reason after this happens day after day after day, the farmer really likes me because every day he comes out and feeds me. So, the next day, every day when the farmer comes out, the turkey thinks, the farmer coming to feed me. Is the turkey always going to be right? What's going to happen one day? Farmer's not going to come out with feed. He's going to come out with an axe. <laughs> and then it will not be a good day for that turkey. Um, past experience does not necessarily tell you about the future. It only tells you about the past. So you might say, okay, wait, wait, wait. But can't, so you're telling me that you can't make an absolutely certain argument that the past tells us about the future. Well, nobody thinks that it's absolutely certain. Why not say it's a probable argument? And that the probable argument is more based on the fact that our inductive reasoning has been successful in the past. In other words, in the past, whenever I've thought, whenever I've made an inference that the unobserved thing will be like what I've observed, it almost always works out that way. And I've done this in the past several times, and every time in the past I've done this, or most of the time I've done this in the past, this inductive way of reasoning pans out. That's not going to work either. Let's take a look at what Hume says on 546. And this is, um, in particular, you'll, at the very end he talks about this creating reasoning in a circle. So this is the... I want to read that whole paragraph that's the, the first full one on the right side. He says, If we are therefore engaged by arguments to put trust in past experience and make it the standard of our future judgment, these arguments must be probable only, or such as regard matter of fact and real existence according to the division above mentioned. But that there is no argument of this kind must appear if our explication of that species of reasoning is, ad is admitted as solid and satisfactory. We have said that all arguments concerning existence are founded on the relation of cause and effect, that our knowledge of that relation is derived entirely from experience, and that all of our experimental conclusions proceed upon the supposition that the future will be conformable to the past. To endeavor, therefore, the proof of this last supposition by probable arguments or arguments regarding facts regarding existence must be evidently going in a circle and taking that which is the very point in question for granted. Let me see if I can illustrate how this is arguing in a circle, how this is not going to work. This is what we're trying to do, right? In my past observed experience, it has always been the case that unobserved things will resemble observed things. So, in my future experience, that which I've yet to observe, the unobservable things will resemble the observable things. This is circular because to get from claim number one to the conclusion, you have to assume this. Unobserved things will resemble observed things. That's the only way you can connect that first claim to the conclusion. If you think about it, something like that is the only way you're going to get that done. But this 
claim I've got underlined here, that's essentially the conclusion itself. So if I try to say, well, look, in the past, all of my inductive reasoning has, has been successful, therefore I can trust my next instance of inductive reasoning, Hume is going to step in and say, no, you can't, you can't make that argument. That, you just use the conclusion to prove the conclusion. You've just said that my next instance of induction will be like my previous instance of induction. My, um, the unobserved instance of, of induction will resemble the observed case of induction. But you have no, once, so you can't make this case at all without assuming the very point you're trying to prove. Um, let me go back real fast. Does this make sense about the circularity issue I'm trying to, to highlight here? Because Hume, despite his faults, he, he is right about this. Um, I don't think that there's anyone that doubts that he is make, that he has the right he's making the right criticism of people who might be trying to use induction to prove induction. Um, are there any questions about about what we're doing right now with this? Is this making is this making some sense? I'll give you a chance to fire back at Hume and maybe give you a chance to see how we can, if there is a way to make to make a case for inductive reasoning. Maybe I should give you the summary. So here's our big summary of how he's, <coughs> the problem that he's raising. So in the first case, we, uh, we showed that you can't make the claim that unobserved things will resemble observed things on the basis of relations of ideas. And you can't prove that through experience or a matter, by matter of fact. And thirdly, there's no other way that you could even think about this. It's either a matter of fact or a relation of ideas. So if there's no other way to know or justify that unobserved things will resemble observed things, then it follows, well then there's just no way to know or be justified in believing that unobserved things will resemble observed things. Which means that the next time you get in your car, if you're going somewhere tonight, put the key in, and you think, I am perfectly justified, and it is, it is a reasonable thing for me to think when I turn this, that my car will start. Hume says you have no rational basis for that. That the, your belief that it will start is just as well founded as somebody's belief that when you turn that, you know, clowns will rush into your car and jump in as well that your belief that when you turn the key it'll start your car is just as well founded that when you turn the car it'll start raining inside your car. There is no reasonable basis for making these, these beliefs, for, for holding these kinds of beliefs. But here's the crazy thing. Inductive reasoning underlies everything you do that really matters in life. Like you set your alarm to wake up in the morning. Why do you think it's going to wake you up? because in the past it's woken you up. You think when I, you know, you study and prepare for an exam that it will help you on the exam. Why? Because in the past that's helped. You think that, um, you know, you give somebody money in exchange for food, that they're going to give you the food. Why? Because that's the way it's always worked in the past. Every, I mean, you can't, it's, there are very few significant beliefs that you can think of that don't rely on this. So if Hume is right, he is saying for just about every belief we hold that is of significance to us, there's no rational basis for it. Now let me maybe put the ball back in your court for a moment. Um, maybe ask, what do you think about this? Like, do you think he's right? Or maybe secondly, sometimes through these questions and answers, we can get a better understanding of what he's even claiming here. So, what are you thinking about? Yeah. Oh, I feel like he takes the, the minority of things that do change <coughs> and applies them to everything that might not change ever, but still says it's wrong, just because a little bit of things did. One thing to, to see 
what he's doing. He's not arguing because every now and then it has failed us that it's unreasonable. So he's not kind of doing like a Descartes kind of thing where you might say, well, in the past one time it was wrong, like the Swan case or something. Therefore, you can't trust the future. It's more along the ideas that just by un contemplating what we do know, there's nothing to guarantee that the next time it will help us. Is everyone content with being told that most of your beliefs are held unreasonably? No. Yeah, this is a bit outside of this, but <laughs> in mathematics, I'm, I'm a math major. I learned that uh, the, like, <coughs> most of like what we know about numbers is determined from axiom, from induction, from axioms. Mm -hmm. So if he's doubting induction, then like he's doubting most of mathematics. So yeah, being able to prove the consistency and completeness of mathematical yeah. systems would be done as well. He might be okay with that. Why? What is the difference in this case? Well, he would still be fine with, because you wouldn't have to throw out all of your beliefs of math. You just have to throw out your beliefs about ma about the completeness and consistency of entire mathematical systems. So those higher order beliefs about the systems of mathematics, right. he could says, yeah, maybe we can doubt that. But that doesn't require him to give up 2 plus 3 equals 5, or that you know the interior angles of a triangle have to add up to two right angles. If you sit down with your family over Easter, and they have, like a, I don't know if you like to do a traditional meal, something like turkey or ham or smells good, and you're about to bite into it, you should think, Hume says, I don't know what this is going to taste like. I have no clue. That for all I know, I could put this in my mouth, and it could taste like dog poo. Share that with your family though, over uh, your gatherings this weekend. Um, Hume doesn't leave us in in the lurch here. He does have some kind of answer, although what I want to press you to think about is whether this is a, a, a good answer. Um, Hume's answer is what he calls custom or habit. And we're gonna, I want to read a little bit of 549 here, and my question to you is to, to articulate what he's saying here. How does custom or habit explain our inductive reasoning? Um, so look on the right column and the, full, the first full paragraph there. So, he said, so here's going to describe his answer. He says, this principle is custom or habit. For wherever the repetition of any particular act or operation produces a propensity to renew the same act or operation without being impelled by any reasoning or process of the understanding, we always say that this propensity is the effect of custom. By employing that word, we pretend not to have given the ultimate reason of such a propensity. We only point out a principle of human nature which is universally acknowledged and which is well known by its effects. By its effects. Um, so what, is, what, is, what does this sound like to you? How is this supposed to explain our cause and effect reasoning, our inductive reasoning here? just something, do. something we do over and over again, and we so one we talk, we get accustomed to it, we get habituated to it. Um, most of you probably know about the famous psychologist Pavlov, right? Mm -hmm. That Pavlov, he was able to train dogs to salivate at the ringing of a bell. Um, how did he do that? What's that? He would give them food when he rang the bell. 
So at first, with the dogs, if you go up to a dog and you ring a bell, do they salivate? So how did you... you well, would, like, when he was giving them food, he would ring the bell, and they would make the connection between the two. So after a while, they just assumed they were going to... So after a while, all he had to do was ring the bell, and they thought, I'm getting food, because the two things were just constantly put together. In the same way, Hume is essentially saying that's what we are constantly doing. That when you start, when you put the key in the ignition and you expect that car to start, it's not because you thought it through and you're a really smart person and know that your past experience somehow makes it probable that your future experience will be the same. It's just custom. You just, it just is something you've been, the way I would put it, you've been conditioned to believe. So, the repetition of any particular act or operation produces a propensity to renew the same act or operation. But the key thing is to remember that it is without being impelled by any reasoning or process of the understanding. It's not like you're intelligently figuring this out. Hume says, really, all that's going on here, you've been conditioned. And we're, we, as a, as a race of people, that's what we const this is the way all of our reasoning works about cause and effect. It's just conditioning. It gives us a psychological expectation, but it provides us with no rational grounds. Another way he puts this on the very top of 550 is when he says, all inference from experience, therefore, are effects of custom and not of reasoning. So he still says there's no hope of, of like giving a rational answer to the problem of induction. There's still no way in which we are able to come up with some premise or some claim that shows how we can go from past experience to future experience. It's just, you've been accustomed to that. We've been trained to do it. We expect it as a matter of psychology. What do you think about that? Is that a satisfying solution to the problem? Seems a bit weak. Why do you say it's weak? I don't know, maybe he's like <coughs> bringing, bringing down everything that we thought <laughs> was true and then all these things that we're used to it. <laughs> but Seems Seems pretty weak. Anybody may think that maybe there is some something better to be taken from this. I, I've tried to, I've tried to depict it as pretty weak. Is there a, maybe a better way to take this? What's that? In what way? Yeah. It's like one time my wife got, you know, I was doing yard work and she said, the car's not starting. My first thought is, you're not doing something right. <laughs> yeah. One of the things with our car, the one that, that she primarily drives, like the steering wheel, if it's locked, for instance, it won't start. So you have to kind of turn the steering wheel as you get it. And I was thinking, oh, it's probably that thing. But it turned out, actually, that we had um, a, a bad starter. So, um, once again, it's the sort of thing like we have certain expectations that almost give us a sense of confidence about things. But doesn't it, does it bother you that this sense of confidence isn't really grounded in anything rational, but it's just this kind of psychological expectation? I mean, if everything that is really important to us is like this, doesn't that mean almost everything that's important to us isn't really, it's just like that? It could, it could go kaput just like your car? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> There are no guarantees in life, 
But and that's true. But I always wonder: isn't there something to be said about? Isn't it still reasonable to think otherwise? Like, sure, I could go to bed tonight and die. But is that just as reasonable as thinking I will go to bed and wake up tomorrow? Isn't there something more reasonable about the claim that I will wake up to live another day? Yeah, Brian, the other Brian. <laughs> well, can't you say that you, <coughs> like, the, going back to the car example, cars are built so that they will start. So for that reason, can't you say then that it has more of a possibility of starting than not starting? So this would come back to then saying, well, how do you how do you know? Like, so you talk about they were built to start. Like, what does that mean? That well, according to certain like laws of physics and, and other things, right? So how do you know that the laws of physics aren't going to change tomorrow? So the assumption is the laws of physics are going to stay the same no matter what. But Hume would say the only reason you think that is because in the past they haven't changed. <laughs> But there's nothing inconsistent about the thought that tomorrow morning we'll wake up and gravity is different. That the law of electromagnetism is different. <laughs> yeah? I, I just a question. Is it possible that we're using the word could to, like, vaguely? Because what if it's what we're saying is possible just cannot happen? Like, it's not, it actually is impossible. Like, um, like birds can't have like laser beams shooting out of their eyes. Mm -hmm. But according to this, that could happen, but it's not possible. And part of this is based on some deeper things Hume says about cause and effect. That for him, causation really just is a matter of closely connected events. So, I mean, for him, there doesn't that's all you need for one thing to be the cause of another thing. Um, some people think that there needs to be something more than that, that just closely connected events that continuously happen is not enough to give you causation. But, uh, so for, if you're thinking like there needs to be some kind of like productive force, some kind of productive ability between the cause and the effect. Um, so when you say birds can't shoot laser beams out of their eyes, it's because you're saying because there needs to be some mechanism that produces laser beams and they don't have that. Um, although we might say, well, maybe if the laws of physics all change, maybe they would have the means for doing this. It's just not, it just couldn't happen under the well, current. Well, we, we don't know that the laws of physics could change. That, that's another could. Mm -hmm. We don't, how, how, is the, how do we know that's a possibility? That might be impossible. Hume would only ask you to say, if you do have the view, if it, if it truly is impossible for the laws of physics to change, you, it, it's incumbent on you to show that. If you can't show it, then that doesn't give us the demonstration. He's working under what we philosophers call epistemic possibility. Epistemic possibility is the idea that for all we know, this could be the case. But there's another kind of possibility, which is called metaphysical possibility. Metaphysical possibility is given the way reality actually is, could things have been different? So we sometimes say, epistemically, it's possible that water has some other chemical formula than H2O. Like we could imagine that tomorrow, chemists all around the world say there's been a, a, a Copernican revolution in chemistry. Water is not really H2O, it's actually got a different chemical formula. In fact, all of our periodic table and everything we put into that, it's all wrong. There's a whole new way of thinking about chemistry. But given the way the world actually is, water couldn't be anything else but H2O. Like H2O is what water is. So Hume is thinking more in the first sense that you can imagine water is different than it actually is. Um, I don't know, do I have another slide? No. Okay. Um, so that is Hume on induction. Um, and that's really the main thing I'm, I'm going to ask you to take away from Hume. And this is a real serious skeptical problem. So, um, next week, of course, I'll be posting essay questions. Um, the one that will be posted about Hume will definitely be about this problem. Are there any questions about the setup of the problem or the responses to it that you think would be helpful in you have being as prepared as you would like to be to think about that?
Then let's take a short break and we will do our last bit of the reading, which will not take another hour. So let's go ahead and stretch our legs, take a brief break. Let's be back at, let's say let's be back at 722. And then we'll wrap up today's class.